In 2001, 20 years ago this year, my colleagues Andrew Lang, Jamie Bach, and Bill Holtzapfel came up with a proposal for what would later be called BICEP. BICEP has morphed over the years into BICEP2, BICEP3, and now BICEP Array. It's a stunning series of experiments that unfortunately I'm no longer involved with if you've read my previous book, A Farewell to Arms. No, Losing the Nobel Prize. I described how I came to both part ways with and also be inspired by the continuing developments with the BICEP team. Recently, an analysis was published in Physical Review Letters, one of the most prestigious uh, journals in all of physics, that has the most stringent limits to date on cosmic inflation and the observable signature that might or might not be present from an early inflationary expansion of the universe. While I'm not involved with the project anymore, I'm fascinated by it, and I want to explain to you the significance of these results and where will cosmologists go from here. Come along into the impossible. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Spoiler alert! We haven't discovered anything in this field in terms of unequivocal proof or evidence for an inflationary origin of the universe. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence, as we've talked about, but there's also competing models, ranging from Sir Roger Penrose's conformal cyclic cosmology to Paul Steinhardt and Aegis's bouncing cosmological models, and many more that we will discuss in future videos. Now, the question of whether or not the universe originated in a massive superluminal expansion known as inflation has fascinated me personally since the early 2000s when I first came up with the idea to build a tiny refracting telescope, one that Galileo Galilei would surely recognize, at the bottom of the world, Antarctica, specifically the South Pole. And over time, we made more and more sensitive upper limits. That is, we've excluded an inflationary energy event above a certain value. Cosmologists parameterize the amount of inflationary gravitational wave energy by what's known as the tensor to scalar ratio. The symbol is lowercase r. And that is the relative ratio between so-called gravitational wave or tensor perturbations and ordinary density or scalar perturbations. I'm your density. We've been setting limits on these, uh, on these effects for over a decade with the dedicated BICEP series of experiments. And this new recent result comes from the BICEP 3 incarnation of BICEP, which is a massive expansion to anything I would have ever conceived of back in 2001. This is an instrument that has about a half a meter diameter aperture, and it's uh, significantly larger, almost three times larger than the original BICEP 1 aperture. It can cram in many, many more detectors and couple those detectors with very, very uh, sensitive phased array type technology. In the original BICEP-1, we only had uh, 49 polarized metal machine feed horns that we used to detect these tiny differences in the amount of polarization in the microwave background. But the incarnation of these telescopes from BICEP-1 to BICEP-2, which used transition and superconducting detectors, to the current BICEP-3 and now BICEP array series of detectors, um, has been a slow, steady increase, not unlike your iPhone ha and its evolution from iPhone 1 all the way up until the current iPhone 13. And back in 2001, we barely had iPods, and it's just stunning to think about how far the technology has come. And these detectors are made by brilliant colleague Jamie Bach at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and also uh, supported via a wide variety of scientists all over the world. And even though, as I say, I'm not involved with the BICEP3 and beyond incarnations, I still can't help but feel a tiny bit of interest, vested interest, if you will, in the success of the project. Recently, we, uh, we heard a great fanfare announced because of the threshold that was reached by the BICEP3 experiment. This is re uh, reproduced from the Physical Review Letters article, I'll show it on the screen here, that broke through this barrier. It broke through what's called the, an uncertainty level on the amount of tensor to scalar ratio, the amount of gravitational wave energy in the early universe, produced presumably by an inflationary event where the inflaton scalar field had fluctuations of the space-time metric that then nucleated waves of gravity which travel at the speed of light, endure for all time, and can make it to our detectors even today, but we choose to detect them and their presence back on the surface of last scattering. And that surface of last scattering is an imprint, a fossil record, of how the universe looked when it was only uh, 380,000 years old. So we're kind of putting the detector system back as close as we can to the uh, source of the explosion, if you will, if you think of inflation as a sort of type of explosion that ignited the Big Bang that we l subsequently measured. 
The results reported by BICEP recently indicate that, that we're below the 1% level of sensitivity. The precision level needed to measure gravitational waves has broken through the 1% barrier. And even though the likelihood of the gravitational wave signature is slightly above a, a mere uh, two-time multiple of that one sigma result, namely the two sigma upper limit, is actually higher than the uh, two times the 0 0.009 R uh, precision level. Uh, that's because the likelihood is slightly shifted over, i.e. it looks to the naked eye, to the untrained brain, as if there's a slight detection of gravitational wave energy, but there's not. There's not significant enough to claim detection. But the, the power and the procession from, uh, from the relatively crude measurements that we made with BICEP-1 and even other competing experiments, including my own experiments, the polar bear experiment and other contemporary experiments, have, all, have, have yet to approach anywhere near this level of sensitivity. Now, we hope to proceed even further back in time and closer to the source of primordial tensor perturbations, if they exist. And remember, the stakes could not be higher. Because if inflation takes place, Many of the most prominent scientists do believe that the multiverse paradigm is also ushered into a state of believability, maybe even proof by discovering this. And that we know for sure would be one of the conclusions because that's what happened back in 2014 when BICEP2 made the premature discovery claim that we had discovered gravitational waves from the universe's inflationary epoch. Now, that was retracted later on. Our conclusion was retracted. We didn't make a blunder. The experiment is exquisitely sensitive and far more sensitive than any other experiment ever done of this type. But the interpretation as owing to a primordial cosmic event rather than dust in the Milky Way galaxy uh, had to be uh, essentially the uh, uh, disconfirmed um, result. So we weren't able to establish this conclusively. Now, it doesn't mean that gravitational waves don't exist. It doesn't mean inflation didn't take place. It doesn't mean the multiverse isn't true but we would like to have evidence. And so the BICEP3 team has now taken data from more than just the one frequency we used in BICEP2, namely a two millimeter wavelength, or 150 gigahertz frequency. Or with BICEP1, we had three channels, 90 gigahertz, 150 gigahertz, and 220 gigahertz. But those detectors, the very few of those, operating in the, in the higher frequency bands. Now, cosmic dust in our Milky Way galaxy was the ultimate source of the large tensor to scalar ratio we claimed back in 2014 and is the subject of losing the Nobel Prize. But that, uh, that was later found to be, uh, to be able to be removed using data from the Planck satellite, who were our competitors at the time, and still, you know, kind of frenemies and friend, no, we're not friend, we're not enemies, but we do, we did eventually collaborate together to, re, uh, to reduce the uncertainty uh, from dust and actually show that dust could contribute the dominant, the preponderance of the signal that we claim to observe. Now what's interesting is that BICEP3 is able uh, in the very near future, if not now, to actually no longer need ancillary data from another instrument, namely from the Planck satellite, to go deeper into the removal process to get rid of the cosmic schmutz that contaminates the local galactic neighborhood, the dirty window, the dusty window that we must look through with our cosmic instruments. So it's fascinating to note that kind of the gauntlet has been thrown down by this uh, phenomenal team that continues to work on a single goal. And although there hasn't been a detection, this is an important proving ground because what it does is it starts to eliminate many, many classes, entire classes of models of inflationary parameter space. So we're able to really narrow down and zoom in on the allowable regime in which these inflationary models could have taken place. Now, will we ever be able to rule out inflation? I claim no because even if we don't ever observe gravitational waves, we could still make the claim that inflation took place, but the energy scale of inflation was too low to manifest a observable background of gravitational radiation that persisted to this epoch of last scattering. So we can't really falsify that inflation took place. Some say that is a negative for the inflationary model and, and it's non-comporting with the scientific method, that things should be, as Karl Popper said, falsifiable in order to constitute good science. We've talked about that a lot. I won't go into it again in more detail. There are also uh, haters of the inflationary theory that pos because it posits the existence of a multiverse, which some claim is antithetical to the scientific method because everything that can possibly happen does possibly happen. And we'll talk about that in a future video as well on the physics of free will coming soon. So where are we? We've ruled out a lot of inflationary uh, models. We would need to measure an inflationary gravitational wave B mode signal that I've talked about at length in other videos uh, in order to conclusively demonstrate the existence of these gravitational waves. And that would be important 
because that would not only help provide evidence for inflation and maybe even narrow down even further, as much as humans could ever do, narrow down the um, uh, varying parameters that characterize the inflationary universe. It would also eliminate other contenders for the cosmic genesis event. In other words, it would eliminate things like the bouncing model, the ekpyrotic model, the conformal cyclic cosmology of Sir Roger Penrose, the string gas cosmology of Robert Brandenburger and Kamran Bafa that we'll talk about in other videos on this channel. So this non-detection is actually an important stepping stone towards an ultimate measurement, perhaps, of the cosmic genesis phenomenon, if indeed it did take place via inflation. And if it didn't, we may see surprising results along the way. So these are really truly heroic results. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy for my former colleagues and friends on the BICEP uh, experiment. I wish them great success. And of course, with our small aperture telescopes that we're building here at UC San Diego, at Princeton University, at UC Berkeley, um, around the uh, Simons Observatory, our small aperture telescopes. These will hopefully set an important limit or constraint or detection, perhaps, of these primordial B-mode polarization signals. And I claim, this is my editorial opinion, that one experiment cannot make a definitive claim anymore. We will not be satisfied in this field of cosmology unless two different experiments can confirm the same type of signal. They don't have to measure the exact same thing. That's almost impossible in science. They have to measure broad, broad consistency so that we can develop a consensus that inflation took place. If, again, if indeed it did, who, who knows if it did? But it's quite exciting to note that no one can really go uh, to the limits themselves. No one goes to Stockholm themselves <laughs> anymore. We need to have confirmation if indeed this exists. And I think that hopefully uh, we will make great progress. Again, as a scientist, you never want to bias yourself with the confirmation prejudice that you are going to detect that which you set out to detect, because it often leads you to reject things that are perfectly acceptable, uh, but just don't comport with your philosophical or scientific worldview. So for now, this exciting news released from the BICEP uh, team, the BICEP3 team, and I'm eagerly awaiting uh, new results to come from this uh, exciting field, including results that will come from hopefully right here at UC San Diego and the Simons Observatory team around the world. If you like this video, you're certain to like my conversation with Juan Maldacena about the origin of singularities, ADS CFT, and other wormhole fascinations. Click here and don't forget to subscribe.